another event of our series, Behavioral Science Talks. This is Alki Leopoulou, and our speaker today is Harvard Business School professor and my professor at, in Behavioral Science, Max Bazerman. So on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Association here in New England, I want to welcome everyone from around the world. For some of you, I know it's 11 o'clock at night. For some of you, it's even 3 a.m. at night, but you still show up. So I just want to thank everyone for making this happen because you guys are here. Uh, before we start, I uh, just want to give a reminder, and I'm going to paste this in the chat as well. We have uh, uh, February 4th, Robert Cialdini. Uh, Robert is um, the, the person responsible of why I got interested in the field of behavioral science years ago, and he's the father of persuasion. And as I've mentioned before, practically every single behavioral class I've taken at Harvard uh, mentions uh, his work. February 25th, we have Robert Waldinger. Um, he's a professor at the Harvard uh, Medical um, School, and he's one of the speaker of one of the 25 most popular TED Talks of all times. So his research is on happiness, and I highly recommend uh, both speakers. So I'm going to paste everything uh, for you guys to sign up. And uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, Max for anyone who doesn't know him. Uh, I've been lucky enough to witness his work uh, in roles as a professor and as a consultant, as a researcher. And I have to tell you that he's one of the most well-respected and well-known professor in academia and the industry in this field, and a researcher with one of the highest level of integrities I've ever seen. So as Angela Duckworth from UPenn calls him, part behavioral scientist, part mensch, and the sage she consults whenever she's stuck on a life decision. So Mark is here to talk to us uh, about his recent book, Better Not Perfect. I want to thank Rachel Crinklaw from the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Relations for all her support for this series. And we're co-hosting our events with the Alumni Association and various uh, Harvard clubs. So uh, Stuart uh, Pesco is here, uh, with the president of one of the clubs. Uh, why don't you uh, welcome the clubs of the area and then we can uh, get started. Thank you, Alki and uh, Max. It's very good to see you. Looking forward to this one. So I'll be very brief. Uh, Let's see if you can top that uh, inauguration speech yesterday. That's a lot easier than topping that poem yesterday, I'll tell you that. Anyhow, uh, I'd like to welcome my uh, colleagues from the uh, Harvard Club of Merrimack Valley and other uh, fellow clubs from Northern New England. Uh, again, another very good conversation today along the lines that uh, we've been able to do with the Kennedy School and with Alki's leadership. And uh, we thank her very much for making these arrangements and look forward to uh, a very good hour with uh, Professor Bazerman. So I'll kick it back to you, Alki, and let's get rolling. Thank you, Stuart. We're going to uh, take Q&A throughout the way, but we're going to uh, answer at the end. Just use the Q&A function or raise your hand uh, in, the, in Zoom, and we're just going to uh, allow you to talk and, uh, and even use your video so you can, uh, you can uh, speak your question. Uh, Max, we're ready for you. Thank you so much, Alki, and thank you for all you um, have done um, for us, both in terms of the series and all you did as a member of the staff at HKS and as a student. And Stuart, thank you for um, your kind introduction. Um, and I'll, I'll start from, um, from the beginning by saying I don't plan on competing with yesterday. Yesterday was an amazing day. Um, I'm not going to beat Biden's speech. And, um, I don't ever want to be competing with Amanda um, in terms of speaking. So um, if your bar is that high, give it up. I'm not going to keep it. Um, what I hope to be is better, um, but not perfect. And I hope that I can provide some advice to, um, to the majority of the people listening on how perhaps they might be able to change their behavior um, to be better, even if they can't be perfect. And I'll talk about sort of why not perfect um, in just a little bit. Um, let me say, uh, uh, let, let me uh, review what Alfie said. Uh, the plan is that I'll talk for about a half hour and then we'll open up for questions. Um, I'm gonna be busy, so I'm not gonna be reading the chat. Alfie Al will be, um, and if there's any, any problem or anything that we just need to interrupt, interrupt for as we go, um, send it in chat and Alfie will make the decisions on whether I should change gears in terms of anything that I'm, I'm up to. Okay, so um, for those of you who didn't know it when you signed up, um, this is primarily a talk on ethics or morality. 
Um, and that's what I mean by better. So, so I, I, what I want to provide is a realistic guide to how you can move toward your own personal maximal sustainable goodness. Now, some of you might know me from my work in decision making or negotiation. And in both of those areas, um, we often use a concept of rationality. And rationality is this pure state that economists work on in terms of their models of the world. Um, but for those of us at the Harvard Kennedy School, at the Harvard Business School, um, rationality ends up being a goal state, not a state that we actually plan on getting to. So even if we use contemporary definitions of a goal state so that we are flexible about what it is that you value, um, we still don't assume that you can necessarily get there. And we study some of the systematic bounds to rationality that exists. Um, and this is the biases in the heuristics literature that so many of you know. And then being in a professional school, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about how can we move toward rationality, even if we don't think that we will ever get to the pure state of pure rationality. And I would argue the concept of rationality is a terrifically useful device, even for those of us who think it's not a particularly accurate description of human behavior. And I want to do, I, I want to develop a, an idea of morality that parallels this work from decision making. And instead of maximizing, maximizing individual value, which we might think of as what rationality represents, what I want to think of is a goal state of maximizing value creation across all sentient beings, or what philosophers have called utilitarianism. And I want to represent that as a goal state um, that we strive toward, even if we know we can't possibly get there, and if that's a moral standard that's far um, too perfect to see as a viable state to achieve. So I want to use utilitarianism or maximizing value creation across all sentient beings as a state of a goal to identify what our bounds are to utilitarianism, biases, selfishness, mythical fixed tie, tribalism, and then move on to pres prescribing some ways that we can create more good. And for those of you who aren't willing to sacrifice very much, I'm hoping to propose that you can do far more good in the world, even without sacrificing more. To the extent that you're willing to forego some benefit to yourself to help others, that makes it even more powerful. Um, undoubtedly, we have people here among the audience um, who are well-versed in philosophy and aren't utilitarians um, and have strong deontological views. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go on. And I want to simply say for now um, that um, we can add whatever constraints you want, but I think most of us would agree holding other things constant would like to create as much good as we possibly can. Okay. Yes. Before we continue, I just wanted to uh, point out that the, what the participants are saying uh, is that you have the notes uh, version, so everybody can see that. I thought it was a new function of, uh, of Zoom. Ah, but okay. yeah, it's the presenter uh, mode for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for pointing okay. us. Okay, so um, I'm not sure. So I, I'm having a problem with share screen. So I, I apologize. Um, it, it it shows great if you do the if you, yeah. if if you do the, the the third button on the the fourth button on the top left. The third button the of the top. fourth button at the top, yeah, the very Design? Top, very top, yeah, over right there. there. Yep. Let's see if this works. How do I do? I guess it's not working, but it's okay. I think this is a better a, a better version than the than before. Okay, so I I recently updated and I. And uh, this is the first time I've, I've run with the updated version in Zoom. So, um, so I apologize. Um, so what slide are you, do you currently see a slide that says utilitarianism? Just the first. So if you go to the, I think you were just starting the fifth. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, so I apologize for that. Um, Thank you, Mr. Um, so, um, in summary form, when I think of utilitarianism, um, these are the, the criteria that I'm thinking of, maximizing aggregate pleasure, minimizing aggregate, aggregate pain, um, being efficient, um, making decisions um, where, your prefer where your preferences are, are not based on your own welfare status in society, um, and valuing quality of the interests of all. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to now show you something that many of you have seen before, but perhaps not the variation that I'm going to present to you. And I just want to highlight what I'm thinking about in terms of utilitarianism. And this is the famous trolley problem, or almost the famous trolley problem, because this is a slightly different version. And I'm just going to present it to all of you. For those of you who are trolley veterans, please pay attention, because there's going to be a couple of changes coming up. Um, and in this problem, that's you with the question mark above your head. And the trolley's coming down the track. And if you do nothing, it's going to move to the left and hit those three people on the left hand side, and they will die in an, in an instant and painless death. You have the ability to turn the switch. If you turn the switch, switch, it'll move the train onto the other track where you save three people. But unfortunately, the person on the right hand track will die as a result of your actions. And it turns out that most Harvard Kennedy School students, most Harvard students for that matter, um, are switchers. They tend to lean towards switching. And if you ask people which is the more, more moral action, they also believe that it's more moral to switch. So I'm just going to present to you that as an empirical result. Um, you know, but that's um, about three quarters of the people switch. Um, and we have 344 people. So, you know, there may well be, you know, 80, 80 to 90 people out there who are saying, no, I wouldn't. Okay. Now I want to compare that to the second problem, which many of you have again seen before. And that's again, you with a question mark above your head. And this time the trolley's coming down the track. And your decision is whether or not to turn the switch. If you turn it, you'll save those five people. And the means by which you'll save those five people is the switch will open up the floor underneath the person on top of the bridge. He will fall, get hit by the trolley, become what's technically called a trolley stopper, and you'll get a five to one deal. So you'll, you'll notice that the mechanism is a little bit different, but this time you're being offered a five to one deal. Despite being offered a better moral deal from a utilitarian perspective, the majority of people don't drop him. And um, there are a variety of reasons that uh, our colleague in psychology, psychology uh, Josh Green, explores in detail about why people won't use that person as a means to stop that trouble. So um, quickly, um, we tend to switch for the three for one deal um, when we're simply switching tracks, we tend to not take the five for one deal when it consists of using the guy on top of the bridge. Now, of course, many of you have many other ideas, um, but in the experimental version, we're, you're limited to the question switch or don't switch. All right. Now, those two problems are really background to the problem that I want to show you and I want you to be thinking about. And this time, um, you can see yourself because you always look the same. That's you with the question mark above your head. And there's two trains coming down two different tracks. If you turn lever A on the left, you'll get the three for one deal. If you turn the lever on the right, you'll get the five for one deal. Um, and only one lever can change, can move. So you can either switch on the left, you can switch on the right, or you can do no switching at all. And now when we give people this problem, switching on the right becomes more popular than switching on the left. And the reason is that comparative mode of reasoning leads people to generally make wiser decisions um, from many, many other studies, but also to make more utilitarian decisions, to make decisions that do more good. In other research that I've done with Iris Blanet and Alexandra Van Geen, um, both of the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, 
we show that when people compare two or more candidates, they are less sexist when they evaluate than when they evaluate one candidate at a time. So in some sense, we can improve morality by moving people from one option at a time to considering multiple possible alternatives. So what I wanna do now is work on a slightly harder problem. And that is how do we get people to, to drop the guy? Now, not, again, not all of you want to. Um, and um, so you may not sort of like my advice, but I'm, good, I'm looking at this from a utilitarian perspective and trying to figure out the question of if I want to save more lives, how do I get people to drop him? And I want to introduce a character to, uh, to you that the philosophy majors obviously know, and that's John Rawls. And John Rawls was famous for um, a number of different ideas, but one of the two most famous ideas that he was known for was the concept of the veil of ignorance. And in simple form, what John Rawls argued is that if we wanted people to think about how to fairly create a society, we would want them to go through the mind exercise of thinking, how would they want society created if they didn't know who they were, if they didn't know what country they were born in, what, what, what their sex would be. And he argued, if we can separate people from their own identity, they would, they, they would come up with more just decisions. So what we do is before we ask people the problem that you just saw about whether or not you're gonna push the guy, whether you're gonna drop the guy from the bridge, we ask you to think about that you could be one of the six characters involved and that there's a one six chance you're the guy on the bridge and there's a five six chance that you're one of the people on the track. And from this perspective of not knowing which of the six people you are, but imagining that you are one of them, what do you want the decision maker with the question mark over his head to do? Now, most people say um, drop, okay, so that they have a five, six chance of worth living. And then what, regardless of whether we ask people, okay, now back to the original problem, what would you do with the question mark above your head or what's the moral thing to do? Um, now, all of a sudden, people are much more enthusiastic about dropping. So this is a second tool that um, changes how people think about the question of what's the most moral decision that would be possible. Now, some of you might be tired of trolley land, um, so let's move to something that's on our minds. And I'm gonna talk about um, the key scarce resource from about you know, 10 months ago. Um, so we're not gonna be talking about vaccines because they don't have the data on vaccines, but, but I think you'll see the relevance to the current vaccine problem and what I'm gonna present to you. Um, I want you to think about the following problem. Should a hospital's only remaining ventilator be given to a 65-year-old patient who arrived at the hospital first, or a 25-year-old patient who arrived moments later? Assume that the patient who gets the ventilator lives and the other one, the other patient dies. So who should get the ventilator? Now, um, most utilitarians would say that the 25-year-old should get. Now, for those of you who are 65, and it turns out I'm 65, um, we could think about wonderful characteristics about the 65-year-old who would change our mind, or terrible characteristics of the 25-year-old who would change your mind. But the problem is asked in the abstract, where all you know is age. And it turns out when we ask people this question, people are dramatically affected by how old they are. So young people tend to think the 25-year-old guy should get it, and the older people want to give it to the 65-year-old um, to the, to the woman. Okay. There's no gender implied in the, in the person um, who will receive it. All right, so this is kind of interesting. But then we add, a for a different group of people, we add a veil of ignorance. Now, this is a tough veil because it's hard to imagine that you could be the 25-year-old or 65-year-old, but that's exactly what we ask people to do. 
we tell people, if you didn't know whether you were going to be the 65-year-old or the 25-year-old, what should what would you want the decision maker to do? And they say they'd want to give it to the 25-year-old by a very large percent because they'd rather get an extra 60 years if, if, if it turns out that the 25-year-old gets it rather than perhaps another 20, year old, 20 years, the 65-year-old um, gets it. And what we see is after people have a veil of ignorance to go through first, and we ask who should get it, now all of a sudden, this egocentric uh, preference in favor of helping my own group largely disappears. And 60% of all the groups are in favor of giving it to the 25-year-old, consistent with a utilitarian perspective, with, which puts this weight on life years saved rather than simply the number of lives saved. Okay, so what I want to do now is talk about um, some different, different kinds of ways that we can think about value creation that could um, help us. So what I've been talking about so far is the, the first line item there, deliberation over intuition. Um, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Link, has done a great job in getting um, professionals to trust their intuition. And I think that the world is significantly worse as a result of his nudge towards intuition. Everything we know from systematic studies that looks at where do we make better decisions suggests that deliberation is better. And I've also given you a couple of different tools on how to think more deliberatively in either um, decision-making context or ethical decisions. And those two tools are to think about, compar about problems comparatively rather than looking at one option at a time and use, using the veil of, um, of ignorance. Um, I think we can also do a better job of value creation. So many of you, when you were at Harvard, you took the negotiation class, which talked about how do we create more value um, by making wise trades between you and your negotiation opponent. Um, and here I'd like to suggest that if instead of having the other side from the negotiation on the other axis, we think about the value to all other people, I want to suggest that there's lots of times when there are trades out there that would get us to a Pareto efficient frontier that could make the world a whole lot better off by making those wise trades. One example, which we'll come back to um, in a number of slides, is the whole world of effective altruism. It turns out that organizations that we might give our charitable dollars to vary quite dramatically in terms of how effective they are. And by making wiser decisions about how we donate our time or donate our money, we can potentially create far more value than going with our intuitive decision of who happened to ask for our funds most recently. And I think that we could generally do a better job about thinking about all of the pleasure and pain we create. Most of us can think about domains where we're very good. And while we might not want to talk about it, other domains where we know we could be a whole lot better. And I think that we need to think more about the areas where we're weakest. And if we think about the Sackler family, um, we can see their name in, across the entrance to lots of important organizations that we value, including organizations at Harvard, where they have, through their philanthropy, had an amazingly positive influence on society. But this same family is responsible for the death and agony of hundreds of thousands by their mismarketing of opioids through Oxycontin in their firm, Purdue Pharmaceuticals. And this is captured long ago in a cartoon about Andrew Carnegie, who many of you will know is both an amazing philanthropist, um, and he was also a truly ruthless owner executive um, in the steel industry. Um, and this cartoon tries to capture that, and I think the Sacklers would be a good image for um, options uh, for our current exemplar of the same idea. Okay, so I want to now talk a little bit about some different domains where I think that we could 
um, do more, where we could create more good, where we could be better. Um, uh, one of them is noticing and speaking out when there is bad behavior around us. Um, we could think of lots of evil characters um, from Trump to Madoff to Elizabeth Holmes to Theranos to many executives in the Volkswagen Dieselgate um, scandal um, to Adam Newman at WeWork. Um, and what's striking about all of these situations is the number of people who were complicit around them, not just the true partners who shared their role of doing evil, but those who simply chose to stand by and allow this to occur. So undoubtedly, Trump had a variety of white, white supremacist groups who were his true partners. But there were also a lot of people who simply wanted lower taxes, conservative justices, who were willing to put up with his evil behavior at remarkable levels so that they could get what they want. And I think that when we have evil in our society, we need to do a much better job of speaking up. Reducing waste. You could think of this as taking your leftovers home, but you could also think about Amazon's H2 headquarters search, where they had over 200 different municipalities spending millions of dollars a piece to create bids to lure Amazon to their locality. And certainly, um, a company is allowed to send out an RFP um, on a wide scale basis. But I want you to think about what that does. So in terms of getting good options, I think that it was probably effective despite the debacle in New York that, that followed on the H2 headquarters. But from a moral perspective, I think it was incumbent on Amazon to think about the fact that at least 200 of those organizations were wasting scarce taxpayer dollars when they had approximately zero hope of actually landing the H2 headquarters. So for Amazon to look like they were open-minded and um, to have a small, very, very small probability of finding a great opportunity in the bottom 200, they wasted the taxpayer, they wasted this tens of millions of taxpayer dollars in the process. I'm using your time wisely. This is um, one of my um, favorite topics in the, um, in the book. And um, all of us tend to make the claim that our most scarce resource is time. And I would argue that if we evaluated how we used our time, we would find lots of opportunities um, to use it better. My colleague at Carnegie Mellon University, Linda Babcock, um, who some of you know for the book, Women Don't Ask, um, what she noticed was that if you're a talented professor, pretty well organized, get stuff done, you get an enormous number of re requests on your time within a university context. And Linda is a very impressive person in lots of ways and a well-known person who gets stuff done at Carnegie Mellon. So she noticed that she just had an enormous number of requests for her time. And I think an interesting question is, does it make you the best person to always try to say yes? And I think that the answer to that question has to be no. If you say yes to too many things, there are gonna be other things that you simply can't get done. And cancellation, canceling on people is rarely on the Pareto efficient frontier of creating lots of different, of lots of good in the world. Personally, um, personally, I find this idea of thinking about my time very, very powerful. Um, 15 years ago, for my 50th birthday present to myself, um, I did an audit of the activities I do in life. And I have a pretty good life. Um, my job is a pretty spectacular job being a professor. Um, lots of freedoms, lots of good tasks. But I tried to figure out what things I didn't necessarily enjoy. And on that short list, Certainly faculty meetings where I didn't think my 
my input was all that useful. Um, but another activity that I wasn't fond of, yet I spent a fair amount of time doing, was peer review for academic journals. And as most of you know, academics publish through a peer review process. And that means there's an awful lot of papers that need to be reviewed by an awful lot of journals. And the, as you get older and become better known, um, more and more journals ask for your time. And the result was that at age 49, I found myself spending lots of time re reviewing papers that absent that obligation, I probably wouldn't have wanted to take the time to read. So for my 50th birthday part of present, I quit four academic journals, not because I was mad at them, not because I was against the peer review process, <clears throat> but rather I thought that my time could be used more efficiently. And in the meantime, I thought that there were younger scholars who in fact would like the opportunity to do some of those reviews and would get a better experience as a result. I may be deluding myself, but I honestly believe that the world was better off from my decision to quit those journals. And finally, <coughs> we make a lot of decisions about where to donate our, our philanthropic dollars. Sometimes you donate them through the year as options come to you one at a time. And sometimes in December, you sit down with your significant other and you think through where to send your charitable dollars. Um, I wanna highlight a number of issues. One, I predict that you make better decisions when you think through lots of the options at the same time, because you get into a comparative mode and you're thinking about where your dollars can do the most good. I also wanna highlight that the data suggests that we're remarkably ineffective in where and how we donate our charitable dollars. And there's a movement out there called effective altruism, which focuses very, very much on how we can think about the bang for our buck that we're getting. So certainly the effective altruism movement encourages us to donate more, but even controlling for how much you do not donate, if you actively think about and, and do some research on the question of where will you have the most impact, you can have far more greater, you can have far greater impact by um, identifying effective organizations. And goodgivewell.org good, well is a good source for reading more on that particular theme because I see the clock running by. So um, I'm gonna close by um, simply uh, sort of highlighting the fact that, um, that we talked about a wide variety of strategies from your time to your thinking patterns um, to your charitable behavior. And the, the expectation isn't what philosophers ask of you. Philosophers ask, ask us to move towards some ideal state, whether it's utilitarian or deontological. Um, and I think that that's too much for most of us. So what I wanna ask you to think about is, is it possible to move toward your maximal sustainable goodness, perhaps by donating more, but certainly by no, donating more effectively, by deliberating more, um, aiming to do as much good as you can, and then some to be better, even if you can't be perfect. So with that, I'm gonna stop and turn things over to, uh, to Alki, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments or, or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, thanks so much for your talk. I'm gonna uh, start it off with a question and, and uh, guys feel free to just share, uh, add your questions in the Q&A or, or raise your hand and I can uh, give you permission to talk. So I'm gonna start it off with a practical question by Viktor Sidortov. Sidortsov. Uh, he's, he's interesting, I think it's a good question actually, to learn what uh, time management system you use in uh, your daily work. Sure. So, uh, so I, I just gave um, Victor one answer, but it's quite possible I even gave it before he, he, he entered his, 
I, I gave it after we entered the question. And that is sort of, I, I audited how do I use my time to think about where I'm creating the biggest impact. And I identified a domain where I wanted to reduce my behavior to free up time for other activities. And I gave the example of, of you know, sort of quitting, uh, quitting a number of editorial, um, uh, the boards of, of a number of academic journals. Um, but I think I, I think about my time um, very much in that kind of, in this kind of way of thinking where I could have the most impact. So uh, so I don't think about um, what topic will lead to a publication the fastest. I think about how to use my time to create as much good as I possibly can. So when people ask me um, to give a talk, um, I honestly think about is that a good use of my time? Not from a selfish perspective, but you know, at age 65, I'm pretty confident that my dinners are going to be covered for the rest of my life. So I'm going to do okay. Um, I have no plans of retiring soon. So when I think about doing well, I think doing well for the all sentient beings on the planet. Um, so um, I, I try to keep that in mind in terms of do I give a talk or not? And I'm happy to be talking to the 320 of you right now. Um, and th this was well above bar. But there are other times where I get requests to do podcasts. Um, you know, I, 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 um, earlier today, I got a request from um, a podcaster who's associated with a not-for-profit holding company that also runs an online gambling facility. And should I do that podcast or not? Well, I would have, they were asking me to talk about better, not perfect, but I kind of decided that wasn't over the hurdle. So I very much think about activities um, in this kind of way. Is it a good use um, of, of my time? Um, sometimes I think about consulting opportunities in terms of if I take in and I donate the money away, is the world better off um, if I do that? Now, I wouldn't want to use that as an excuse to work for Exxon, because I think that net-net, the impact might be far worse rather than far better. So I, I'm constantly thinking through about net impact in terms of project selection, consulting opportunities, speaking opportunities, um, and even what I teach in, in, in a classroom. So in the classroom, sometimes you got to make trade-offs between what do you think will create the most good in the future behavior of your students versus what will be most popular on that particular day. And I like to think that I want to positively influence the future behavior of my students more than I want to maximize my teacher evaluation. I concur to that. Uh, Monere Development Services, uh, some representative uh, is here and, and I'm going to let you uh, talk uh, right after this question so you can be ready. Rosie Feng is asking, how would you advise maximizing your time during these uncertain times, especially during months and months of lockdown? Yeah, so, um, so to begin with, I think that with these months and months of lockdown, it's easy to get into bad habits in terms of how we use our time. Um, it's easy to sort of um, watch too much TV. It's, it's, uh, it's um, easy to spend too much time surfing online with no particular purpose in mind. So I think that we want to avoid bad habits. Um, but I think we can also think about the future and think about um, where, if, it, if I can't have as much impact as I normally have in my, in my pre-COVID life during COVID, how can I plan for the post-COVID period? in terms of activities that are going to have a dramatic influence. Um, we're not going to all come up with the same conclusion. So, um, okay, since you were um, my student a few years ago, um, I, I, I spent a lot of my time um, in the vegan investing world. And the vegan investing world consists of people who invest their dollars in creating um, alternatives to um, killing animals to produce meat. So you can think of this as veggie burgers, but also the next generation of cell-based products and a variety of new vegan products. And the whole world of vegan investing comes out of the observation that preaching to people about how that they should become a, a vegetarian or vegan 
isn't particularly effective. What is effective is to produce new products that people want to eat instead of eating an actual animal product. And as a result, we see almost no growth in the percent of vegans in the country or the world, but we see 20% annual growth in meat alternative products or plant-based products um, because we're doing a better job of creating alternatives. So I, I think about that as a model of if I want to create change, and I'm giving you one example of what I think is a change it's, that maximizes aggregate good across all sentient beings, you want to think about the mechanism by which you do that. So, um, but we're all going to come up with very different strategies on how we think about Hey, I'm gonna pass it on to um, the speaking part. Okay. Monere, you're, you're on. Monere. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you well. Great. Um, I was gonna put my camera on, but I can't seem to find the the uh, button for that just so I can say hello in person. But anyway, uh, my name is Monica. I'm tuning in from Ireland. Um, lovely to hear from you, Max, and thank you for that. Um, my question is around, I, I really I like your point about managing your time better and making better decisions and being more, uh, taking the time to investigate things rather than just saying yes to them, like you did with making sure that any places you're speaking at don't have some underbelly of, of you know, um, uh, bad business practices and treating people badly. But that is a, I would suggest that is a luxury that comes with having reached a certain place in your life where you can step back to make those decisions. How do we get regular people who are young or younger? Um, you're by no means old, but like I'm, I'm kind of heading in that direction at 42 now that I need to just slow down a bit and make more decisions, make, make better decisions and just think about things. But how do you, how do you have a 22 year old do that? Who, who thinks it's all about speed and race and have to make X amount of money by Y time. How do we help everybody in the world to realize, to, to, to learn this lesson a bit earlier? Terrific question. So first of all, I, I consider 42 to be quite young, you have to understand. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so the fact that it's on your mind that 42 is a, is a sign that young people are, are actively engaged. Um, so um, so uh, first of all, I wanna um, highlight um, sort of a, a potentially critical part of your comment, which could be re restated as Max, this is easy for you to say, um, given that you're already a professor at Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I, other people are trying to make their career at a much, much younger stage, how do you get their attention? So to, to begin with, I wanna highlight that some of, some of the ideas that I've suggested um, have no cost. All they require you to do is to be smarter. So mm -hmm. to be more deliberative in your thinking, um, you'll make wiser decisions. Wiser decisions make the world better. So it, without talking about morality, if I, could, if I could get all of you to simply make better decisions, the world would be better as a result. So there's no conflict there. Moving to the Pareto efficient frontier of whatever you're doing, whether you're negotiating or sharing some of your time or sharing some of your money, doing it more wisely is not a costly activity. Um, reducing waste um, costs nothing. So one of the things that I find kind of fascinating is that uh, our, our, the, the cultures represented on this call differ, but many of us live in cultures where a, a quote unquote doggy bag or a take home bag from a restaurant is viewed as kind of a inappropriate thing to do. And I think what a shame, how, how do, how do how would we ever normalize the fact that wasting food is a good thing? Um, so I think we want to change the mentality about that. And um, the, the final thing that I want to talk about in terms of age um, or stage of life is that uh, I, I, I sort of mentioned effective altruism. And, and again, givewell.org is a good website to get started to learn more uh, about effective altruism. Um, but the world of effective altruism is primarily a young person activity. So people my age donate money shockingly and effectively. The world of effective altruism, which is organizing 
what data can tell us about the effectiveness of organizations and helping people to give wisely is a movement that's dominated by people under 30 years old. So we see people at a very early stage of development who are very much thinking about how do I do more good given, given whatever capacity I have to give. And you also see sort of spin-off organizations from the effect of altruism. Well, for example, one group is called 80,000 Hours. In 80,000 Hours um, is an organization devoted to helping young people think about how do I pick a career at a much earlier stage uh, of development where I can have the maximum positive good across my lifespan? Um, and again, I'm not arguing that you should take a vow of poverty in order to be, to be good. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm simply suggesting that all of us can be a whole lot better. And I think that there's more capacity if we can convey this message to young people rather than to my cohort. So I'm very, very interested in your question and in, to think, and, and thinking better about the question of how do we change the behavior of people earlier on. As a 65 year old, um, I think that I'm better than I was last year. Hope to be better next year than I am this year. <clears throat> um, but um, I sure wish, wish that I had read this book called Better Not Perfect when I was 20 years old. I think I could have had more impact in my life. So that's really what I want to aim for. So um, your question is just perfect. Um, I, uh, I plead guilty to making arguments that it's easier for a professor at Harvard who's 65 to implement than a 20 year old who's trying to sort out their career. But I think that we want to do everything we can to, to apply the arguments at a much younger um, point in our career tra trajectory. And, and um, at the risk of self-promoting a little bit, I think the book does a pretty good job of doing that across a variety of different examples. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, and, and, and by the way, among the vegan products that I really love is, is that uh, product called Guinness that, um, that you can get in, in your country. I, I've even been on the tour on, on a visit to Dublin. All right, Brian Glasgow, you're going to be the next person to speak. Until then, I'm going to uh, pass it on to um, a question for Noella Walsh. Uh, uh, that's a good segue of she's she knows she, you've written a lot of topics, a lot of books around the topic. And what but what in particular motivated uh, you to write this one? Um, sure. Um, so um, first of all, this is the hardest book I've, I, I, I've the hardest book for me to write. Um, and, and I'd say uh, most of the books that I've written um, from start to finish, I spent about 18 to 24 months writing a book. Um, Better Not Perfect, I, I'd say it was about seven years. And it was because of so many pieces of philosophy that I knew so little about. So I was constantly learning. And there, there were literally times where I took a year off from writing simply because I needed to go um, learn more. So this book was very different. Um, so uh, so I, I'm not sure what, what books Noella uh, was, was referring to. I, I certainly wrote a book called Blind Spots um, with Ann Tenbrun, so that was published in 2011. I think it's a book most similar to this in the sense that it's, it's my only other book that I would describe as an ethics book. But Blind Spots was very much of a descriptive book. It, it described how people actually behaved. This book is very, meant, very much meant to be a prescriptive book or, or, or a book on how to encourage people to have more impact with their lives. Um, so the big difference is between descriptive and prescriptive. And if you think of philosophers as offering normative views of how we should behave and descriptive research as describing how we actually behave, I see this book as an integration of normative and descriptive knowledge to develop a prescriptive framework about how we could think about doing even more good. Brian, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, fascinating and uh, you know timely for my own um, personal life. But 
um, and your discussion of uh, choice led me down uh, uh, that had flashbacks from uh, rational choice theory from um, many, many years ago. And uh, uh, so thanks for bringing back those nightmares. <laughs> but um, my question, question for you is, um, one thing I've noticed, uh, I'm acquainted with a number of people that work in the social services field as social workers and uh, uh, pro bono attorneys and so on. And their approach to, to you know, helping people is like they're on an assembly line and there's another person coming down the line you know, every minute and they've got to help that person that's in front of them. And you know, I always ask, you know, will you ever turn that, into, um, you know, turn that into policy? Take the things that you've learned, be working on the assembly line and figure out how to make the process work better. And it's so hard to get people to look up from the assembly line because they've got another horrible story in front of them you know, every day and they can't ever really look up and say, wow, I know how I could shut off this assembly line you know, before it even got started and save lots of people. So can you, can you talk a little bit about how do you, how do you get somebody to look up from, from the task at hand to see the bigger picture and apply what they know? Sure, um, so, so I don't think that I have any magical answer to that, but, but Brian, I, I, hear, I hear in your comment the notion that they should, and, 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 and my reaction is some of them should, and some of them should simply keep on making their sort of socially important uh, assembly line run more smoothly. So for some people, moving to the policy level is the best way to have impact, but certainly we wouldn't want um, 330 million Americans thinking primarily about policy that mm -hmm. we, we need people implementing. So how do we allocate people wisely, given that people have freedom of choice? Um, but, um, but I would say it certainly makes sense based on your comment that more people should be aware of thinking about problems more systematically. And you know, I think one of the advantages um, of going to an institution like the Harvard Kennedy School is it really sort of pushes you to think about um, the more systematic impact that you can potentially have. Um, so, so I don't wanna sort of endorse that that's what everybody should be doing, but certainly um, that, 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 that seems like a nice connection to an earlier question about what to do with all of our COVID time this may be a great time to think about whether or not um, what, what, what you do in life could be more powerful if implemented in a different kind of way. So I think that, that your comments are very helpful in that, in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, uh, Robert Rodriguez, I'm gonna go to you uh, after. Uh, first, uh, let's take Rosie Feng's question that I think you're gonna like, Mike, uh, Max. Uh, what do you, what do you make the balance between maximizing goodness and your own happiness? Once yeah. Yeah, so, so, uh, um, uh, so from a utilitarian perspective, notice any selfishness you have is going to take away from creating as much good as you possibly can. Um, on the other hand, none of us are willing to forego um, uh, sort of outcomes to ourselves. So in the effective altruism community, there's a, a guy named Ian Ross, who's truly an impressive guy. He lives in the San Francisco area. Um, he works for a high tech firm, makes something on the order of a half a million dollars a year. Ian lives on $10,000 a year in San Francisco and donates the rest of the money away uh, to highly effective charities. And he's often presented as a hero, and I think he is, but I'm not sure he's a good role model. And the reason I don't think he's a, uh, is a good role model is for most of us that just isn't sustainable. Okay? So we're not gonna get there and sustain that level um, of goodness. And so my reaction is um, to think about how can I create more good in ways that I would actually enjoy? And those become no brainers. And I think the more and more we contribute, whether it's our time or our money, the more and more we see the potential of our resources to create good. And that can allow us to get even more joy out of contributing in a wide variety of ways. Um, 
but does that mean that I couldn't do more good by do donating more money? Certainly not. I, I certainly could be better. So my reaction is the push to be better. How much better? Well, we want to push for your maximum sustainable level of goodness. And if we're pushing you too hard and you're going to quit and say, I'm going to go party, then we've missed that level and we've missed an opportunity. I think the people who accept this idea of I could be better and I can figure out how to be better will not only do that in two, 2021, but in 2022, they'll probably be even better. And I think that that's the, the idea I have in mind for how to create that kind of balance. All right, last question, Robert Rodriguez, if you can be short, because we have one minute left. Thank you. Robert, are you there? All right, so let me, uh, let me just uh, ask another question. Uh, we have uh, people asking, I, I think this is a question I'm interested in as well. Um, so if you have multiple things that feel important, how do you choose uh, what is your priority? Sure. So um, so if you go to, I mentioned that this will be the third time I've mentioned the site, givewild.org. It will direct you to lots of very effective organizations that have used sort of Harvard Kennedy School approved scientifically rigorous criteria to define who does the most good per dollar. And, um, but, but this notion of translating that into sort of uh, maximizing utility across all sentient beings is certainly a complex methodological task. What you'll see is that GiveWell tends to see three important categories of behavior. One is to give to the very poorest in the world. And that will typically mean um, organizations doing their work in Africa, India, et cetera. Okay. Um, a second category is future generations. Okay. That, um, and the argument here is that when we run up the debt, as we've been doing in the United States for so long, we're really sliming future generations. And more importantly, when we contribute to global climate change, um, we're benefiting current generations unethically at the expense of future generations. And the third category is uh, reducing animal suffering, that there's far more suffering by animals on this planet than there are by humans, yet our money focuses on humans over animals. Um, and certainly the P Peter Singer view of utilitarianism highly emphasizes the rights of all sentient beings. And once we move into the animal domain, the place where we're creating the most amount of suffering is through, the, through animal farming. And so the third category is to reduce suffering in terms of animal farming um, as much as we possibly can. Um, I, personally, um, I have the greatest empathy for the third category, but I don't mean to argue for that category over the other two. Um, but I am convinced that the effective altruism community has done a good job of identifying three great buckets. Personally, I think I'm more, I'm more willing to spend my time and, and donate my money where I have the greatest empathy. So you do want to have some empathy. But I think if that leads you to conclude that you're going to be donating it to your local opera house, then you're probably not getting the, the arithmetic right in terms of where your dollars can do the most good. Um, so, um, so I think GiveWell.org can help, help each of us sort of think through these processes in more deliberative ways. Um, uh, since we're running out of time, let me sort of thank, uh, thank uh, you for sticking around for so long. Um, Alfie, thank you for organizing. Stuart, thank you for hosting. Um, I appreciate all you, you did. And um, I want to thank everybody for sticking around with me for the last hour. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you, everyone.